Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. If the Avro Lancaster had a motto, perhaps it would be, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Let's take a look at the origins of this iconic British aircraft. Elliot Verdon Rowe was born in 1877 in Lancashire. He was quite a character and an adventurer as a young man. He left home at the age of 14 to go to Canada to learn a trade as a surveyor. He got all the way out to British Columbia when the collapse of the silver market meant that there was no more demand for surveyors. He did odd jobs for a while and then he returned to England working on a railway and then trying to join the Royal Navy to study marine engineering at King's College, London. But his entrance exams weren't good enough, and he was rejected. So he started working at the dockyards and eventually signed aboard the ship SS Jebba of the British and South African Royal Mail Company on the West African run. Supposedly, it was at sea, observing soaring albatrosses where Verdon Rowe developed his interest in aviation. Returning from sea in 1906, he began his career in this field by applying for a job of secretary of the Royal Aero Club. There were candidates that were more qualified than Verdon Rowe. However, he must have really wowed them in the interview because he got the job mainly due to his enthusiasm. Incidentally, the man who hired him was Charles Rolls who was the first half of Rolls-Royce. Verdon Rowe started off as a draftsman and then started designing and building his own models. Only four years later, on the 1st of January 1910, Elliot Verdon Rowe and his brother formed their own business, the A.V. Rowe Aircraft Company, which was later renamed Avro. The company's most popular early model was the 504 biplane, which was used during the First World War and then was used as a trainer by the RAF after the war. They built over 8,000 of them. In 1928, Elliot sold his share of Avro and bought the S.E. Saunders Company, forming Saunders Row. In the 1930s, he actually became a supporter of Oswald Mosley and a member of the British Union of Fascists. Both of his sons joined the RAF during the Second World War and both were lost in action. His son, Leighton, was shot down while flying an Avro Lancaster over Duisburg. Design and Development In 1936, the British Air Ministry put out a specification P-1336 for a capable medium bomber for worldwide use. This specification requested an aircraft with an all-metal construction, a mid-mounted cantilever monoplane wing, and the hope was to use Rolls-Royce Vulture engines, which were in development at the time. Initially, at least, the Vulture engine looked very promising. Its design was an X-24 configuration, which basically took two Rolls-Royce Peregrine derived V-12 blocks and arranged them in an X shape, all turning a common crankshaft. This super engine was supposed to produce 1,750 horsepower, which would mean that two engines would be sufficient to power the new big bomber. Avro designed and submitted an aircraft that was called the Manchester. With the dark clouds of a new world war looming, the Avro Manchester was designed to be built fast and repaired easily. The fuselage was all metal with flush riveted skin of aluminum alloy to reduce drag. The wings had two spars and the fuel was contained in several self-sealing tanks within the wings. This was intended to allow the biggest bomb bay possible in the fuselage. The tail was a twin fin and rudder configuration which allowed for great vision for the dorsal gunner. In the cockpit, the pilot and flight engineer had excellent all-round vision under the expansive canopy. The navigator was seated behind them and had an astrodome for use of a sextant for taking star shots. The bomb aimer station was inside the aircraft's nose. Beneath the forward turret and the optical bomb site was housed in this compartment. The bombs were housed on bomb racks inside a massive internal bomb bay. Originally designed in order to be able to carry two naval torpedoes, 
the bomb bay covered nearly two-thirds of the underside of the fuselage. The Air Ministry thought that it had a winner with the Manchester, and in February 1937 it was selected as the primary candidate for production and ordered right off the drawing board, with Handley Page's aircraft, to be named the Halifax, and the short Stirling airplane were all chosen as the second string. In August 1940, the first Manchesters began being delivered to the RAF, and they became fully operational by November. However, by spring 1941, the RAF was already having major problems with their Manchesters. It turns out the Vulture was not producing the promised amount of horsepower, which meant that the heavy airplane was always underpowered, even when both engines were running. And that leads us to the next problem with the Vulture. The X-type configuration had difficulties with lubrication and dissipating heat. Worst of all, the connecting rods were too weak, which led to failures. About 200 Manchesters were built, and they did fly in combat. But the lack of power and engine reliability meant that the type needed to be withdrawn from operations in mid-1942. This aircraft was destined for the dustbin of history. Or was it? Prototypes. In 1940, even as the first production Manchesters were being delivered to the RAF, Avro's chief design engineer, Roy Chadwick, began working on improving the Manchester design. He decided to try changing out the Manchester's two troublesome vulture engines and swapping in for less powerful but more reliable Rolls-Royce Merlin engines installed on a larger wing. This prototype, serial number BT-308, was initially designed as the Manchester 3. It was later renamed as the Lancaster. On 9th of January 1941, test pilot H.A. Sam Brown took the prototype up for its maiden flight at RAF Ringway, Cheshire. The airplane was a hit from the start, and almost immediately Manchester fuselages were being diverted from their production line to be switched over to the new Lancaster model. Production the initial contract was for 1,070 Lancasters. However, soon enough, the RAF was demanding as many of the type that could be produced. Other companies were soon brought on to build Lancasters. Avro built the most at over 5,000. However, Armstrong Whitworth, Austin Motors, Metropolitan Vickers, and Vickers Armstrong also built them. In all, over 7,300 Lancasters were constructed during the war. In August 1942, a Lancaster Mark I, serial number R5727, built by Avro Aircraft, took off and flew west across the Atlantic in order to be a pattern aircraft for Lancaster production at the Victory Aircraft Company in Canada. It seemed an almost impossible task. The new company was to somehow figure out how to build and put together the 50,000 major separate components of the Lancaster and do it with the newly hired and mainly unskilled workers. Amazingly enough, 16 months after starting, the first Canadian Lancaster, serial number KB700, named the Ruhr Express, was rolling out and flown to Europe to participate in the battle. The workforce of building Lancasters at the Malton, Ontario factory had ballooned from 3,000 to almost 10,000, and at its peak they were building a new bomber every day. In the end, building over 400. The Canadian Lancasters had U.S.-built Packard Merlin engines installed, and there were several differences in instrumentation and turrets that were available in North America. Overall, the Lancaster was an exceptional aircraft, being described as a near-perfect airplane for its size and type. It was fast for its massive size and very smooth in flight. Pilots described it as handling like a fighter and being fairly easy airplane to fly. Lancasters were able to be looped and barrel rolled, and sometimes they were even able to outmaneuver their Luftwaffe attackers. 
They were very strongly built and could take a lot of punishment and still come home, even able to limp home back to base with two engines. One complaint about the Lancaster was that the wing spar, which went right through the fuselage, was a major obstacle to moving about the aircraft. Another problem was that the escape hatches were too small, making the Lank much harder to escape from if it came time to bail out. The depressingly low statistic was that only 15% of downed Lancaster crew were able to bail out. As a comparison, in the Lancaster's sister RAF bomber, the Handley Page Halifax, 25% of downed air crew were able to get out successfully. In American bombers, 50% of their crews were able to get out, although most of these escapes were done in daylight, when it was easier to find the bloody hatch to get out. The standard crew of a Lancaster was seven, the pilot, and beside him, the flight engineer. The flight engineer's position was equipped with instruments to manage the engines and fuel system. Below them, in the nose, was the bomb aimer. During the bomb run, he laid prone on the floor, looking through the bomb site. The rest of the time, he manned the Fraser Nash FN5 nose turret, which mounted two 303 caliber machine guns with 1,000 rounds per gun. Behind them sat the navigator at a desk facing port or left behind a curtain so that he could use a light to use his maps and charts and do calculations and see the instrument panel in front of him showing airspeed and altitude. To the left of the navigator was the stack of radio equipment and the wireless operator sat behind that facing forward just in front of the main spar. He had a window to his left and the astrodome was above him, which was used for visual sighting when the navigator needed to do a star shot for celestial navigation. Behind them was the mid-upper gunner who sat on a canvas sling beneath his turret. He had 1,000 rounds per gun for his two 303 caliber machine guns. Way in the rear was the tail and Charlie rear gunner with four 303 machine guns. Due to the Luftwaffe's rear approach technique, this gunner position proved to be the most important in the whole aircraft, and several modifications were made over the course of the war to try to make it more effective. Some gunners removed portions or the entire perspex panel in order to have a better view to look for night fighters. The Rose turret, which mounted two 50 caliber machine guns for greater punch, was installed on a select few Lancasters, and some late war aircraft had these guns guided by radar. One of the biggest advantages of the Lancaster was its massive 33 foot long bomb bay, which seemed to be able to hold everything except the kitchen sink. Of course, the Lancaster could haul 500 and 1,000 pound general purpose high explosive bombs, but it could also carry the 4,000 pound high capacity bomb, which was known as a cookie, and with modifications such as a bulged Bombay door, it could carry the 8,000 pound or 12,000 pound cookies. It could also carry the SBC or small bomb container, which held between 24 and 236 4 or 30 pound incendiary and explosive bomblets. If that wasn't enough, it could also carry anti-shipping mines and anti-submarine depth charges too. And if all of that wasn't enough, the Lancaster was the delivery aircraft of choice for several very special bombs, such as the Upkeep Bouncing Bomb, the Tall Boy, and the Grand Slam Super Bombs. Operational History Number 44 Squadron, which was based at RAF Waddington, Lincolnshire, became the first RAF squadron to convert to the Lancasters in early 1942. And the first actual mission of the aircraft was on the 2nd of March 1942, when Lancasters from this squadron dropped naval mines in the vicinity of Heligoland Bight. Eight days later, on the 10th of March 1942, they were on their first actual bombing mission, which was an attack on the German city of Essen. During the course of the British night bombing offensive, increasing numbers of Lancasters became available, but due to their superior performance, the RAF and Bomber Harris really would have preferred to get even more. 
he went so far as to call it Bomber Command's shining sword. There was even much debate about whether to convert the factories building Handley Page Halifaxes over to building Lancasters. There were clear advantages to the Lank over the Halifax. Unlike the almost fighter-like performance of the Lancaster, the Halifax had an annoying rudder problem that, even with modifications, never really went away. If a Halifax pilot threw his machine into a dramatic maneuver in order to try to escape from flak or night fighters, they were likely to unbalance, lock on, and eventually produce a spiral dive from which it was very difficult to recover. Overall, Lancasters were slightly faster, had a higher ceiling than the Halifax, which was important in avoiding attack. The Lancaster's exhaust flames were less visible at night, and Bomber Harris complained that he had to use his Lancasters as a safety blanket to protect the more vulnerable Halifaxes. Lastly, the whole point of the offensive was to deliver the most weight of bombs to the enemy, and in this purely numerical, statistical analysis, the Lancaster was the clear winner. The Halifax's bomb bay was smaller and divided into sections, meaning that it was incapable of carrying the big 4,000-pound cookie bombs or any of the exotic, bigger weapons of the RAF. On average, over its operational life, the Lancaster would deliver 150 tons of bombs onto German targets, while a Halifax would only deliver 100. It also took fewer man-hours to build a Lancaster than it took to build a Halifax. So knowing all that, why didn't Britain stop building Halifaxes and convert over to all Lancaster production? The main problem was the time required for conversion. If the British aircraft industry was to start converting its production to Lancasters, then there would be an overall drop in bomber production during that time while the factories rejigged. For British leadership, all the way up to Churchill, this was unacceptable. Also, there was some worry that there wouldn't be sufficient Merlin engines to equip any more Lancasters. The Halifaxes used an alternate engine, which was the Bristol Hercules. In fact, the worry of Merlin engine supply was so serious that the Lancaster B2 version was developed to use this alternate engine. About 300 of these radial-engined lanks were built. There are some warbirds that during the course of the war are asked to do more and more and seem to accept modification after modification and just keep on doing good work. The Lancaster was one of them. Some variants had bulged bomb bay doors to carry the giant 12,000-pound tall boy bombs. The doors were removed completely to carry the enormous 22,000-pound Grand Slam bombs. 23 Lancasters were built to carry the bouncing bombs codenamed Upkeep for the now-famous dam-busting raids. For this very unique mission, the bomb bay doors were removed and special mounts were installed to carry the bomb. A hydraulic motor, which had formerly been used for the mid-upper turret, was fitted to spin the bomb. What about the mid-upper turret? Well, it had been removed to save weight. Lamps were fitted in the bomb bay and nose for the simple, yet very effective, height measurement system which allowed for the accurate measurement of low-flying altitude at night. The Lancaster was even considered to carry the atomic bomb to Japan, before being rejected in favor of the B-29. Lastly, Lancasters were also involved in missions of mercy, dropping food packages instead of bombs to the starving masses near the end of the war. Some Lancasters were modified for air-sea rescue, with an air-droppable lifeboat carried in an adapted bomb bay. Observation windows were added to the fuselage. There was a modification for photographic reconnaissance with all the armament and turrets removed and with a camera carried in the bomb bay. I've already mentioned the Lancaster 10, which was the Canadian built version with the Packard built Merlin engines and the use of Canadian and US made instruments and electrics. You know that a warbird is really special when the original design spawns even other types of warbirds. 
The Lancaster is extra special as its basic design ended up spawning a veritable flock of other war and post-war birds. In 1945, the Lancaster design was modified to such an extent that the new aircraft was named the Avril Lincoln, even though the type doesn't look that much different. The wings were lengthened and new two-stage supercharged Rolls-Royce Merlin 85 engines were fitted. The fuselage was enlarged so that it could carry increased fuel and bombs, including the Grand Slam. With these modifications, it would also be able to fly higher and farther than the original Lancaster, with a maximum altitude of 35,000 feet and a maximum range of 4,450 miles. A few more than 600 Lincolns were built. A further spawning was the Avril Shackleton, which was the long-range maritime patrol version of the Lincoln. Rolls-Royce Griffin engines with 13-foot diameter contra-rotating propellers replaced the Merlins, and many changes were made for anti-submarine warfare operations, including special cameras and radars, equipment to drop sauna boys, and a diesel fumes detection system to sniff for subs recharging their batteries. It could carry up to nine bombs, three homing torpedoes, or depth charges. And it had two 20mm cannon in a Bristol dorsal turret. 185 were built, and the last one was retired in 1991. The Lancastrian was a passenger and male version of the Lancaster. The early ones were conversions, however, later versions were built as pure passenger planes. Even though the type was not well suited for passengers, being fairly cramped in the fuselage, they continued in service until 1960. The Avril York was the transport version of the Lancaster. Although 258 of them were built, production was slow at the start as the priority for materials and production was all devoted to the bombers. One of the prototypes, series number LV-633 and known as Ascalon, was the personal transport and flying conference room for Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Avril Yorks were also employed after the war during the Berlin airlift. Lastly, the Lancaster airframe was so versatile that it was used as a testbed for many new engines, including the Metropolitan Vickers F2 turbojet, the Armstrong Sidley Mamba, various Rolls-Royce Dart turboprops, the Avro Canada Orenda, and Swedish Stahl Dovern turbojets. Survivors We are lucky enough to have many surviving examples of the Lancaster. Some are just on display. At least one is able to taxi around, giving rides to the public, and two are airworthy. One, PA-474, was built in 1945 and arrived on the scene too late for service. She is now part of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight in the UK. Lancaster Mark 10, serial number FM-213, was built at Victory Aircraft in Malton in July 1945 and was taken on strength by the RCAF on August 21. She now flies as Vera, the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's Lancaster. I have actually seen this aircraft in action multiple times, and her picture is actually the logo of World of Warbirds. I would love to get a ride in her one day, and if so, I promise to bring you along. She flies every summer for events in North America, and has even returned to Europe to fly with her sister Lancaster previously mentioned. Let's hope that both continue to fly safely, showing new generations the power and majesty of the Avril Lancaster. And lastly, the next time you experience a setback in your life, think of the utter failure of the Avril Manchester, and think about how, with a little imagination, this disaster of an airplane became one of the most successful aircraft of all time. Until next time.